All right. Happy Resurrection Sunday, everyone. I hope you're feeling well out there. Today is Sunday, February 7, 2021. Wow. So we're already in the second month of this new year. We hope you're doing well out there with the uh, current pandemic that's still ravaging this uh, sad world. And uh, hope you are keeping uh, your church and your family and everyone in your prayers. We've had some uh, people we know that have died, which is very tragic, uh, some due to the virus. So please keep your prayers going with the uh, churches in South America, Peru with Pastor Ed, Central America, Alex in uh, Australia, <clears throat> Europe, and other places. So please uh, remember the saints across this world. All right, so today we will be putting on pause for now the study uh, of Isaiah. We've been going through the book of Isaiah, so you can go and check uh, the past videos on our on our uh, what is it? YouTube.com forward slash restoration. Uh, sorry, focus on the kingdom. <laughs> Uh, YouTube channel, and this is our website, so you can find all the information here. So if you go to the home page, you will see that there are links to the channel, <clears throat> youtube.com, there you go. You can also check out the recent uh, debate I had with Trinitarian Michael Burgos, did the sun pre-exist eternally? And also this Friday, Sir Anthony gets back in the debating game with uh, KOGmissions.com event. The host is Tracy Z, the founder of KOG Missions. Also, please uh, check out her uh, vol voluminous website. She has a ton of material here. Excellent. So if you click here, as you can see, upcoming events, that should take you to the YouTube live event page. Uh, if you're on YouTube already, subscribe to her channel <clears throat> so you can get the alerts whenever she's on or she puts out a new video and so on. So subscribe, just hit that bell button. She will host uh, this debate between Sir Anthony and Jonathan Burke, who is a Christadelphian, which is a non-Trinitarian group uh, originating from the late 1800s, I believe. And unfortunately, they developed a non-personal devil and demon doctrine. In other words, Satan is not, as we understand, a fallen, the fallen bad angel, unholy angel. But they teach uh, that it's just your nature, your human nature, your flesh, something along those lines. So very unfortunate, but... Um, this is uh, obviously a very important topic. Remember, the devil's bigger, biggest trick is to convince the world that he does not exist. So I think this is uh, right up there with something that we should be wary of, regardless of who is teaching this type of things, by the way. Again, Mr. Burke is a non-Trinitarian. We wholeheartedly agree with him on that, obviously. But uh, this is a serious matter when we do away with the person of Satan or the devil, Diavolos, <clears throat> and his many fallen angel demons. All right, so Sir Anthony will come on as usual, and he will take us through our, the prayer, opening prayer. With the Shema, he will tell us why the Shema, which is a Hebrew word meaning listen or obey, why that is important or it should be important to your church, why it should be the creed of your church, by the way. And then we will move to the youth lesson from Michelle Cox. And then I will lead today's, um, uh, today's um, service. And uh, we will look at the surviving nations in the Old Testament, a very interesting topic that has to do, obviously, a lot with the gospel of the kingdom of God. All right, I will bring Anthony. Good morning, Anthony. 
Yes, hi. That's a nice introduction. The eighth day, 888, is the number of Jesus in Greek. It happens, Jesus, as modern Greeks would pronounce it. We're using the modern pronunciation. And that's the name of Jesus, 888, superabundance. And you're absolutely right. Jesus was asked in Mark 12, 29, please make this a point of conversation with your church wherever you are. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest and superlatively important commandment of all? The one you mustn't miss. The most important commandment of all. It wasn't love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second one. The first one is the definition of God, which is called the Shema. That's the Hebrew word for listen, the imperative form found in Deuteronomy 6, 4. And it goes like this in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, which means one. So if you're interested in following Jesus, would you not think it reasonable to follow his creed? And you might want to ask your local church, are they following the creed of Jesus or not? Are they reciting that? So let's say it together in English. It lead, at least listen, Israel, Lord our God is one person, one Lord, one person. That's what Jesus loves to hear as the creed. That was his creed. And if you're a Christian, you'd think you'd want to have that creed as a superlatively great commandment. So that's my introduction. And uh, I think now we'll un open our services with prayer. And Carlos, as he said, is kindly going to do the presentation this day. I'm getting ready for my debate on Friday. Please do tune in for that if you can and listen to the fascinating question about who is the devil? Who are the demons? Do they exist or don't they exist? Very important question for you and your children, I think. Okay, so here we go with an opening prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for giving us another uh, slice of life that we've lived through this, this current week, even in difficult circumstances here and around the world with the pandemic. You've given us this space of time. You've given us another day to exist, to think, and to conduct ourselves in a godly manner. We ask you to be with all of those who by this miracle, as it really is, the miracle of the internet might be listening to us, that we can strengthen them, Carlos can strengthen them, hearten them, encourage them with the words that he speaks, that we can be built up in the faith as we look forward to the coming of your kingdom on the earth at the future parousia. We ask you to bless us with the operational presence of your spirit, yours and your son, Jesus, who died for us. May that be with us as we proceed through the Sunday service. We're praying all of these things now in Messiah's name. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Sir Anthony. And uh, just a reminder, we usually have Q&A every other week, not this week, not this Friday. It's usually Friday evenings every other week, and that is every two weeks. But obviously, this Friday, Anthony has this debate. So we will probably move the Q&A to next week, the following week, which would be, let's see, Friday the 19th, February 19th, if you can mark that down. And if you have any questions during the weeks ahead, uh, please email us. You can email me at carlos at thehumanjesus.org. And uh, if you have any questions about the youth lessons or the little sermonettes I give before, Sir Anthony usually gives or uh, leads the sermon, the main sermon, you can contact us there. But again, this week we will not have Q&A. We will have something slightly better, we hope, the debate. So... All right, I will bring in uh, Michelle, and she will give a little youth lesson. Let me just get ready here. I believe he's on Psalm 23. Good morning, Michelle. Hey, Carlos. And before I start, uh, if I could just say briefly that uh, Tom and I were not able to tune into your debate last week, but we just listened to it this morning. And I just want to congratulate you on a really good job. Um, it, it just, I think you made your points very well. And if anybody out there has not listened to it, just want to encourage everybody to, uh, pull that up on the, uh, live stream or the, whatever you call it, the, the website and YouTube and, and listen to that debate. Cause I think you did a really good job and I wanted to. Oh, thank, 
Thank you so much. That, ma yeah, that means a lot. Thank I know it's, it's, it can't be easy. You don't ever know what questions these guys are going to pop in with. So, um, but you, you handled it very well. When I was 17, I had a part-time job after school at a restaurant in a city that was several miles away. And I lived on a hill and the, the highway to, uh, was down in the valley and then I had to walk up the hill to get home from school and I, uh, to get home. And I took a bus because uh, you know I didn't have a car, I was only 17. So I had to walk about a half a mile to get up to my house. And because I worked till 10 p.m. at night, it was always dark when I had was uh, walking home. And there was this one particular place where it was like a very narrow street. It was kind of like an alley and it was a tall building on this side and a tall building on this side. So I felt very enclosed and it was not well lit. And so um, it was a little bit scary for me. I was, you know, a young girl, 17 anyway. And it just was scary to walk through that area until I got to the lighted area on the other side. And as I walked through this area, a minute, my notes aren't right here. As I walked through this area, sometimes I would hear a noise or I would imagine that, you know, somebody was sneaking up behind me or, you know, it was easy to be uh, afraid. And so I would uh, stay calm by praying, but also I would particularly recite the words of the 23rd Psalm. I had learned this psalm in choir as a song, and I knew all the words, and it just was very helpful to me. So I wanted to talk about that today. Psalm 23 was one of the psalms written or songs written by David. He was a shepherd boy, and he was chosen by God to become the king of Israel. And it's all about how God is like a shepherd to us. So let's go through the psalm now. Carlos, you can pull that up if you want. Verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that means that God is like a shepherd to us. I think I gave you a study earlier about how uh, all the uh, characteristics of sheep and shepherds and how sheep really need a leader and they need someone to take care of them. They're not very good at taking care of themselves. So God is our shepherd and we can be confident when we have him on our side. Verse 2 and 3 says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. You can see how this is referring to us being like sheep. A good shepherd will take his sheep to pastures that have healthy green grass for them to eat. He will take them to still pools of water to drink. You know, if there's a stream that is running and bubbly and, and agitated, the sheep won't drink from it. They must have calm, still waters. That's just how sheep are. So uh, that kind of peacefulness where we have plenty of food and still waters, that, that can restore our soul. That's what I think he means by that. That whole peaceful uh, scenario there can restore our soul. And the shepherd leads his sheep from field to field. And if we follow God, he will lead us along paths of righteousness or goodness in our lives, rather than going down paths that are dangerous for us. And it says for his name's sake, I think that's so he could be proud of us and we can be a good example to other people of what God is about. Another translation for the valley. Oh, wait a minute. Am I getting ahead of myself? Let me see. Da, da, da. Oh, yeah. Verse four. Verse four says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So another translation for the valley of the shadow of death is valley of deep darkness. And this was the part that I most thought of when I was walking along that narrow alley that was dark and scary. I would recite this psalm and I would fear no evil because I knew God was with me. And then I wouldn't be afraid. So what is this rod and staff? Shepherds had tools that they used to keep the sheep safe and on the right track as they moved from field to field. The rod was a big stick or a club, kind of like this. It's a great big stick. And the shepherd would throw it at an animal that was coming to attack a sheep. So he'd take this thing and he'd throw it to attack a sheep to get to, she or to the animal that was attacking, if it was a lion or a bear or whatever, and it would hopefully chase it away. 
But if an animal was harming the sheep and actually had a sheep and was, you know, killing it, then David would have to go and use his club to kill the animal. So that was used for protection. He used his rod for protection of his flock. The staff is a long pole with the curve on one end. I have one of those here too. So this is my shepherd's staff. Sometimes it's called a shepherd's crook. It's got this bent part at the top. And the staff is a long pole with the curve. The shepherd would hold out the staff along an area, kind of hold it out a little bit, can I hold it out like that, to show the sheep which way to go. So if there was maybe on this side of their path, maybe there was a, um, a rocky ledge they could fall over or a creek they could fall into, the shepherd would stand with his rod and his staff and the sheep would know to bypass it, to go this way. So it was used to guide them where he wanted to go on the right path and to keep them off of a dangerous path. The shepherd would also use the curved end, which, you know, this, and you can imagine what that would be used for, that if a sheep was about to drown in the water or a baby sheep went the wrong way and was starting to run away or fall over a cliff, he could use that hook to grab that sheep and pull him back. I imagine they did that a lot. Later on in the book of Luke, Jesus talks about how the good shepherd will leave his 99 sheep and go find one sheep that was lost and then greatly rejoice after finding him. I won't read that story, but you can go look it up. It's in Luke 15, 4 through 6. So when David says that God's rod and staff are a comfort for him, he means that God, our great shepherd, uses his rod to chase away our enemies or to keep us from getting into something that would harm us. And God's staff guides us along our path in life to make sure we stay on a good path and not get into something that is harmful or use that hook to grab us and pull us back to safety. Now, we know that God doesn't have a big club and he doesn't hit us over the head with it, but we have the words and the teachings of the Bible to be our rod and we have the ability to pray for guidance. So I like to think of the rod and staff as a way of describing learning the Bible, the ways of the Bible, the lessons, and for uh, us to learn to, to pray, to pray for guidance, learn the rules and then learn to pray. Verse five, you prepare a table before me. Now he's talking to God. Before he's talking about God, now he's talking to God. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. So what's that talking about? These are referring to God providing David with good things, such as a great banquet. That would be a very nice. And even though David has many enemies, and if you read the story of David, you will see that different people are hunting him to hurt him. And uh, this anointing has to do with when a guest at a banquet was the honored person at the banquet. The custom was to spread perfumed oil on their heads. And that was just a sign of reverence and welcome for their uh, distinguished guest. And so David is saying that God treats him as a distinguished guest at his banquet. And David's happiness and thankfulness to God is like a cup that's overflowing. Surely, verse 6, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. If we follow God's guidance, as David did, then we will live a life of doing what's right, and God will show mercy, loving kindness, and blessings on us. And the last phrase says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I read in several translation that this phrase literally means, I will return to the house of the Lord. I thought that was interesting because I never actually never had learned that before. And so we know that David is dead and buried, but we know he will live in God's kingdom after he's resurrected and he will be the ruler in charge of the 12 tribes of Israel. It says that in Ezekiel 34, 23, God says, then I will put one shepherd over them, my servant, David, he will feed them. He will tend them and he will be their shepherd. He will return to the house of the Lord in the kingdom. And so that's that return to the house of the Lord. I thought that was really interesting. Of course, we also will dwell in the house of the Lord in God's kingdom once we are resurrected. So this psalm, I think, is filled with lots of teachings for us. It teaches us that God cares for us like a shepherd, and we can trust in the Lord and not be afraid. 
as young people growing up, in this world, it's easy to have fears. And I hope maybe that you could memorize this song like I did, and that it will give you help as you go through life and maybe enter fearful situations. And let's remember that we have God's rod and his staff to help us with guidance and protection through our lives. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> That's great psalm, the great Psalm 23, very often quoted and very good lesson there, especially when you're young, you know, and right now, and, and Michelle, that's so, um, that's so apropos because right now there's a, a pandemic. We've had this thing for almost a year now, and we don't know the toll. Actually, we do know some of it, but the toll that this type of um, government uh, implementations around the world have taken place you know the so-called lockdowns and the toll that is taken on children and the schools being still closed and so on and uh, so this is a very very difficult time for young people we don't know how bad we will know unfortunately one day and uh, it'll come back to bite us all of us but uh, some things are are being known in terms of suicide rates in terms of depression, you know, you just Google stories about the tragic stories. So it's difficult, folks, uh, but life, life is not easy. So the Lord is my shepherd, my shepherd, and he will guide us through the dark valleys of our lives. So let's pray for the young people out there as well, and, and their, the parents, of course. Thank you. All right. So today... I wanted to talk about the surviving nations in the Old Testament, but before we get to that, uh, I have a little, I guess, sermonette again. I'd like to share here if I can, <clears throat> if this will work. I hope it works. Okay, let me see. I'm just. Testing this out. So I wanted to talk about the Sabbath before we get to our main topic here. Let's see if this works a little bit. Okay. I think that looks good. I hope anyway. <clears throat> Did Jesus break the Sabbath or human traditions? In Luke... Chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus asked the scribes and Pharisees, if the law of Moses permitted you to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it. And Mark 3 adds that the people remained silent when Jesus asked this question. Now, the people in question are the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, and they could not answer Jesus' question. Now, most Christians are taught, sorry, I should say, yet ever since Jesus asked this question to his fellow Jews, most of Christianity has answered the question that they could not answer by teaching that the law of Moses did permit good works like healing on the Sabbath. Hence, most Christians are taught that Jesus never really broke the Sabbath but only the so-called human traditions of the Pharisees or any additions by later Jewish scribes and, par and Pharisees. Here's an example of what I mean. The NASB MacArthur Study Bible on Luke 6, 9, good works were especially appropriate on the Sabbath, particularly deeds of charity, mercy, and worship, Works necessary for the preservation of life were also permitted. <clears throat> also, the Ryrie Study Bible, not to heal on the Sabbath would have been to do evil and to destroy life. To heal and therefore to do a good work would be no violation of Sabbath laws. Now, I hope you can see and note here that uh, these uh, commentaries, these study Bibles, offer not one, as far as I know, Old Testament reference as evidence for these claims. 
So I think to properly answer Jesus' question back in Luke 6, 6, we need to look back even further to the Old Covenant and the Sabbath law and what God had originally required from his people, the Israelites, or as we call them today, the Jews. So we have this in Exodus 16, and this was given before Sinai, which is interesting, uh, where the Ten Commandments were given. It says in part, God says to the people, tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today. Exodus 20, which is now at Sinai, where the giving of the Ten Commandments happened, you must not do any work, you, your son, daughter, male, female, slave, livestock, or the foreigner. So the non-Israelite, the so-called Gentile, who is within your gates. And this is repeated across the, uh, the books there of Moses in Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 5, which actually I think re verbatim repeats the so-called 10 words or the 10 commandments. <clears throat> and still later prophets, like Isaiah, uh, like Jeremiah, sorry, and Nehemiah there, as you see, they added this, you must not carry a load out of your houses on the Sabbath day or do any work. The rabbis confirmed this understanding of following the, the, of resting on the Sabbath without qualification, by the way, by saying that carrying anything from one place to another is the last of what they call the 39 works forbidden under their rabbinical teachings called the Mishnah. So carrying things like empty beds is implicitly forbidden in the later, later rabbinical commentaries and, and understanding of the old covenant laws given here in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Furthermore, the importance of keeping Sabbath was part of the identity marker of the covenant people of God, whether, as we just read, you were a Israelite, a Jew, or a Gentile. Here's a quote from the late uh, James Dunn, Dr. Dunn, in his book, Theology of Paul. Observance of the Sabbath became a touchstone of covenant identity and loyalty, Exodus 31. Since the Sabbath was a sign of Israel's set-apartness, failure to keep the Sabbath law was a capital offense. So, for example, in Isaiah 56, the mark of Gentile participation in the covenant would be that of keeping the Sabbath. The result, then, of breaking the Sabbath can be seen by the punishment that was meted out to a man who was picking up sticks, so the account reads, in Numbers 15. While the Israelites were in the wilderness, a man was found gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found the man gathering wood brought him to Moses, Aaron, and the whole congregation. And because it had not been declared what should be done to this man, they placed him in custody. Now, that's it. interesting, right? Because the law had been given already, and they need the punishment for breaking the Sabbath. But for some reason, these Jews who found the man did not know what to do. So they took the man to Moses. And the Lord said to Moses, the man must be surely put to death. The whole congregation is to stone him outside the camp. Now, why outside the camp? Because it was a tradition of the Israelites to understand other commandments like purge the evil from among you, literally. So they would take the offending party and mete out punishments, usually death, outside the congregation, let's call it, or what we today would call the city or the suburb if you're in Australia. So the whole congregation took the man outside the camp and stoned him to death as the Lord had commanded Moses. By the way, this is why Jesus, it is believed, was taken just outside the city, the old 
Jerusalem city and, and killed, crucified. That was part of Romans giving in to the Jewish understanding of capital punishment. In summary, the evidence shows, to me anyway, that there is not one Old Testament reference Christians can point to today where God authorized breaking the Sabbath, Sabbath for any reason, even, quote, good humanitarian works like healing the sick. Instead, there is one clear and very scary evidence for what happened if any work was done on the Sabbath as we read here. But only Jesus, as the promised Jewish Messiah, the second Moses, had been, had been given the unique authority to declare his followers lords of the Sabbath in Mark 2, and that's 2, 27, 28. Only Jesus could declare time and again <clears throat> that human needs are now of greater value than Sabbath keeping. Only Jesus, as God's only procreated begotten son, could free both his fellow Jews and us Gentiles from the unqualified strict obligations of that old covenant Sabbath law. And only Jesus could say that his followers break the Sabbath and yet are innocent. Let me repeat that. The followers of Jesus broke the Sabbath, yet were innocent. Those are the words of Jesus in Mark 12, verse 5. I'll end with this from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. In Mark 2, man and his needs are said to be of greater value than the commandment. The absolute obligation of the commandment is thus challenged. The second saying in Mark 2, 28 goes much further. The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. The Christian community is, conf is confessing Jesus, the Son of Man, who, as the Lord Messiah, decides concerning the applying or transcending of the Sabbath in his lordship, casuistry comes to an end. I think that's exactly right. And I hope you can think about these things. We have many uh, Sabbatarian followers out there. And if you have any other questions and you want a copy of this um, PowerPoint or any other notes, most of our material, by the way, it's, it's free online. If you go and focus on the kingdom.org, we've done a ton of work on this. Sir Anthony obviously has uh, even written a, written a book, which actually let me show you here how you can access the book through the focus on the kingdom.org website. And here we go. So just go to the links. And Sir Anthony, if you don't know, he was involved with a Sabbatarian uh, system called the Armstrong. Uh, Worldwide Church of God, I believe, was the name. He can correct me. I'll, I'll bring an, I'll bring Anthony on soon. So if you go, I'm sorry, I believe it's books. So go to books, scroll down, and he has a little booklet here: the Law, the Sabbath, and the New Covenant Christianity. And there it is, a free PDF. So most of our books and and things are for free. So. Before we get to the main sermon, I'll bring Sir Anthony here. Anthony, if you have any comments about that, please go ahead. Yeah, it's, I think that's a, a subject dear to my heart. And I would add this. Didn't Jesus say that the priests in the Old Testament times broke the Sabbath? And I listen, I'm throwing in another element of the story here. That must be then a foreshadowing of Jesus not requiring the Sabbath keeping in the New Testament. But that's an Old Testament idea, isn't it? Where's that one? Haven't you read in the law of Moses, that's Old Testament, that the priests on duty in the temple are allowed to work the Sabbath. I want to mention that. The priests were exempt 
But as you rightly said, nobody else was exempt at all. You weren't to pick up sticks, but the priests. So that's a kind of foreshadowing. You're getting an idea of what Jesus is going to do, because even the priests in the Old Testament could break the Sabbath and be innocent. But now, imagine this. We can all be breaking the Sabbath and be innocent because we're all priests. Jesus is the high priest. We're all priests of God. And that was foreshadowed, suggested, even in Old Testament times, and made absolutely clear, I think, in the New Covenant under which we now are. Could you comment on the saying here in verse 6? He goes on to say that he is yeah. greater than the temple, Anthony. Yeah. What do you think well, that yes, meant? Jesus is greater than the temple. That's another thing, another item, an idea that was prefigured in the Old Testament. The temple was indeed sacred, the temple building, and the priests working in it were very, very special. But they could break the Sabbath if they worked in the temple. How much more then, how much more, when the real temple has come, that's Jesus himself, then we who are priests and kings with him are not bound by those Sabbath rules. I think that would be the point there. Right. And then verse 7, uh, but you would not have condemned my innocent disciples yes. if you knew the meaning of this scripture. Yes. I want to. I want you to show mercy, yes. not offer sacrifices. I, I, yeah. I suggest, Anthony, yeah. I humbly suggest, mm. that Jesus introduces a qualification here that was not previously right under under the sabbath what do you make okay. of that well it yeah i think that you could certainly say that there are new things in jesus teaching but he reminds us that even under moses the priests working the temple were not bound by sabbath keeping so that was a new covenant thing uh, predicted and foreshadowed even in the old testament that's fine and made very clear as you rightly point out here by Jesus himself. So yes, Jesus is doing something new, but he says it's not entirely new because even in the Old Testament, the priests could break the Sabbath, please note. They could and be innocent. How much more then, now that Jesus has come, he can break the Sabbath and the priests who work with him in the new covenant. We are priests and kings, you know that. We're not bound by the Sabbath in the letter. We're bound by the Torah of Messiah in the spirit which is a different thing all right thank you anthony and by the way if you'd like to contact anthony that's his email i'm sure uh, he gets a lot of emails uh, but <laughs> i'm sure he wouldn't mind yours as well regarding this topic very very close to his heart again uh, don't believe anything we say by the way check it out just because um, anthony comes from that sy system i think uh, you might be saying to yourself well he's biased he's obviously you know his pendulum has swung <laughs> all the way the other way and now he's he's saying the you know the things he's saying but you know test all things we're we're not infallible i'm not infallible certainly so all right, so we will move. I'll bring Anthony on later to give his commentary on uh, what we're going to do here as the main sermon. But I thought since we were doing Isaiah, and we will continue with Isaiah uh, next Sunday. I think we are in chapter 44, Isaiah 44. So again, you can go back and check out the previous sermons. <clears throat> but um, today I thought we might go through some scriptures regarding who Christians will rule over. Who will Christians rule over, obviously, in the age to come? So we're going to read through some scriptures here in the Old Testament, and Barbara will help me out with the reading, and I'll bring her on, and she will read from sections of, let's see, what did we have here? I think we'll start in Micah 4. So if you got your Bible handy or your little gizmo program, we're going to read from Micah 4, uh, Ezekiel 36, Amos 9, and probably one of my favorites, uh, Isaiah 19. So Micah 4, 
Ezekiel 36, Amos 9, Isaiah 19. So we'll just read sections of that. I'll give you my little commentary. Then Anthony will come on and uh, give his. So, so before I bring Barbara, let me set the stage here. We get asked this question often about things that will happen in the age to come. You know, what, what's it going to be like? What exactly are we going to be doing? So if you're like us, who believe that when we die, we die, right? We were dead, the cessation of life. That's what dying means. And obviously most Christians would believe in a resurrection. <clears throat> so we believe that God will bring back to life first the church at the parousia resurrection. Uh, so you can go to Matthew 24 and, and see that. So what will happen then? So let's see, we're in the kingdom, in the new age, the tikkum olam, as uh, the Hebrew writer calls them. And what happens? So we're there with Jesus, and what are we going to do? Okay, so there is a promise, a kingdom promise in Revelation 2. To all who are victorious, says Jesus, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clays. Now, Jesus is alluding here from the famous Psalm 2, which is a prophecy about the Son of God, by the way. And now Jesus is saying, guess what? You guys can read yourselves in that too. In other words, the promise Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel, the Father, gave to me, the prophecy about me, guess what? That applies to you as well. <clears throat> okay, so now I have a question, though about verse 26 all the nations who are these people who are the nations so we will read through a section in micah 4 and i'll bring up barbara here now if she's ready yes. good morning barbara good morning all right so let's see you can start barbara let's start in verse 1 in micah 4 and i'll let you know when and i'm reading from the the new revised. Yeah, that's fine. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. People shall stream to it and many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. The lame I will make the remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion now and forevermore. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of daughter Zion, to you it shall come, the former dominion shall come, the sovereignty of daughter Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished? That pangs have seized you like a woman in labor? Rise and groan, O daughter Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you shall go forth from the city and camp in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. There you shall be rescued. 
There the Lord will redeem you from the hands of your enemies. Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, Let her be profaned, and let our eyes gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan, that, as, that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter Zion, for I will make your horn iron and your hoofs bronze, you shall beat in pieces many, many peoples, and shall devote their gain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. Oh, man, I got goosebumps. I don't know about you, but <laughs> this is the gospel about the coming kingdom of God. I mean, my goodness, I, we could do the, the rest of the year with this, Anthony. But let me just uh, make a couple of comments and I'll bring uh, Anthony up here. Uh, verse 13 is, is quite interesting. Rise up and crush the nations, O Jerusalem. So what do we got here, folks? I'll just focus on the opening here in, in Micah. As you can see there, the highlighted text, people from all over the world will stream there, there where? The Lord's house. Wh what is the Lord's house? Uh, the Bible calls it Zion. We know it today as Jerusalem. So they will go there. They will stream there. And do what? Worship. People from many nations will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, another name for Zion or uh, modern-day Jerusalem, the house of Jacob's God, and we will learn his ways. Listen to that. They will learn from the God of Jacob, Isaac, Moses, David, Jesus, the Messiah. <clears throat> the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion, Jerusalem. His word See the parallel there? Teaching equals word. We'll go out from Jerusalem. So these people are obviously uh, redeemed. They're obviously people who have found favor in the eyes of Yahweh, the God of Israel. That's who they are. They are the redeemed individuals from the current nations. And they will come up. They will finally find redemption. They, they will be forgiven, obviously. They will be changed. Similarly to Christians are changed uh, when we convert, right? So that's who these people are. That's who will we will rule or reign or govern, uh, however you want to look at it, over. So I will bring um, Anthony up here and... Uh, get his take on this Micah passage. If any comments, Anthony, you got on? Well, it's interesting to note that they're going to stream upwards. That's an unusual way to go, isn't it? You don't normally stream upwards. But that's a very striking image there. These nations who are going up to Jerusalem, and you rightly pointed out, to learn. Currently, people learn war. We have establishments which teach you how to be soldiers, how to kill, and that's going to stop. They're going to learn not to have weapons of war. Everybody will sit under his fig tree. That's an image of peace in your own garden, and nobody's going to make you afraid. Right now, the opposite is true. We have to arm ourselves to the teeth to protect ourselves against enemy weapons. But in that day, which, as you rightly said, is the gospel of the kingdom, this is the vision of the future, which gives you goose, goose bumps, it should, all of us, is a vision of the earth at peace, and they're not going to have any army establishments. The West Points, you might say, and the Sandhursts of today's world, those where they, they train soldiers, those will be curio museums. People will visit them and say, do you remember what we used to do? We used to train people to kill each other. We're not doing that anymore. That is a huge, huge blessing. And that is the essence of hope. And I remind you and our audience that hope is because of, let me get this right, faith and love, I should say, are because of hope. That's Colossians 1.4. 
if you haven't got this hope clear in your mind, you're starving the virtue of love and faith. Colossians 1 4. Love and faith are because of, because you're clear about this hope, that's going to enable you then to have love and faith as well. So hope is very, very important. And as Carlos is rightly saying, you're preparing then to help fix the world, which will be under new management at that time. Jesus will be the manager of everything, the governor. And as he writes, he said, the God referred to there is the God of Moses, the God of Jacob, and the God of Jesus. Jesus, of course, is not God, but he's the son of God, and he's the chosen manager of that future rule of God, which is going to be successful. The first successful, genuine New World Order, not the counterfeit, uh, pretend New World Order that we're trying to achieve now, not that, but the real New World Order of the future. Okay, back to you. Thank you, <laughs> Anthony. Um, yes, it, it's quite a striking image. Um, Anthony brought up there the the peace, real peace. We all want peace. We want we we want peace in our lives, and we want peace among us, among our neighbors, among the warring countries. We want one uh, one spirit one mind we want to walk all of us humanity i think at the end of the day we want to just have simple fundamental agreements and walk as one human race and i'm sorry to say if you are a muslim or a hindu or whatever other religion there is out there but at the end of the day there must be one belief there must be one truth there must be one god so the, the, it's not relative. This is not relative. It's going to be one or the other. So let me go back here to the uh, scripture. So we, we know who these people are. I think we're getting a good idea. But I love this next passage here. And now we will go to a passage in uh, Ezekiel 36. Uh, Barbara, as you get ready. So we will read a little bit of this vision. So we got the vision there, Micah. And now we will see how it obviously will coincide with the vision of Ezekiel. And let's start, Barbara, Ezekiel 36, 15. And Ezekiel 36, 15. And if you could just read there until I uh, come in and... Um, interrupt you there go ahead please and this time i'm reading from the new living translation verse 15 i will not allow those foreign nations to sneer at you and you will no longer be shamed by them or cause your nation to fall says the sovereign lord then this further message came to me from the lord son of man when the people of israel were living in their own land they defiled it by their evil deeds to me, their conduct was as filthy as a bloody rag. They polluted the land with murder and by worshiping idols. So I poured out my fury on them. I scattered them to many lands to punish them for the evil way they had lived. But when they were scattered among the nations, they brought dishonor to my holy name. For the nations said, these are the people of the Lord, and he couldn't keep them safe in his own land. Then I was concerned for my holy name, which had been dishonored by my people throughout the world. Therefore, give the people of Israel this message from the sovereign Lord. I am bringing you back again, but not because you deserve it. I am doing it to protect my holy name, which you dishonored while you were scattered among the nations. I will show how holy my great name is, the name you dishonored among the nations. And when I reveal my holiness through you before their very eyes, says the sovereign Lord, then the nations will know that I am the Lord. For I will gather you up from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. 
your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart with new and right desires and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony heart of sin and give you a new obedient heart. And I will put my spirit in you so you will obey my laws and do whatever I command. And you will live in Israel, the land I gave your ancestors long ago. You will be my people, and I will be your God. I will cleanse you of your filthy behavior. I will give you good crops, and I will abolish famine in the land. I will give you great harvest from your fruit trees and fields, and never again will the surrounding nations be able to scoff at your land for its famines. Then you will remember your past sins and hate yourselves for all the evil things you did. But remember, says the Sovereign Lord, I am not doing this because you deserve it. O oh, my people of Israel, you should be utterly ashamed of all you have done. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. When I cleanse you from your sins, I will bring people to live in your cities and the ruins will be rebuilt. The fields that used to lie empty and desolate, a shock to all who pass by, will again be farmed. And when I bring you back, people will say, this God-forsaken land is now like Eden's garden. The ruined cities now have strong walls and they are filled with people. Then the nations all around, all those still left, will know that I, the Lord, rebuilt the ruins and planted lush crops in the wilderness. For I, the Lord, have promised this, and I will do it. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am ready to hear Israel's prayers for these blessings, and I am ready to grant them their, their requests. I will multiply them like the sacred flocks that fill Jerusalem's streets, at the time of her festivals, the ruined cities will be crowded with people once more, and everyone will know that I am the Lord. Oh, man. Um, it just, you know, brings a tear to your eye, this, uh, this uh, prophecies. Uh, by the way, uh, Barbara, if you have a comment yourself, please feel free to make it. Uh, just let me know. Okay, so let me let me comment here. I mean, uh, this is amazing. Uh, look, folks, I grew up agnostic. I came to the faith at 32 years of age. When you're agnostic, you have no hope. There's nothing. When you die, you die. I thought, you know, I wasn't an immortal soul, so-called person. I didn't believe in going to heaven and all that jazz, which you hear ad nauseum as an unbeliever as well, right? Because it's obviously a pagan idea so it's in the air it's almost the air you breathe but you know i did not have that concept and um so you have no hope so then you read this or you hear this you hear the gospel about the kingdom of god you hear this hope you hear about uh restoration renewal um, you hear, re you read about and hear about cleansing from your sins, from uh, your former wicked ways, ways that we, at, at some level, most of us human beings find disgusting and we feel awful about it, about doing wrong, about doing bad things, not just to our neighbors, to ourselves, to our families, but most of all to the creator, to God himself, the father. So I love this image. And this is the gospel. The fields that used to lie desolate in plain view of everyone will again be farmed again. New beginnings again. The restoration of the Garden of Eden, right? We talked about this before. Verse 35, when I bring you back, you see restoration? which is, uh, restoration is repentance as well, right? He will restore us if we repent. The former wasteland, 
like the Garden of Eden. There it is, by the way. Filled with people. Verse 36, very key to this topic. The surrounding nations that survive will know that I, Yahweh, Jehovah. By the way, it does not matter. It does not matter the name of God. I'm not saying it's, it doesn't matter as in terms of, but uh, whether you know how to say, how to write it, uh, I, don't, I don't think God is that petty. Yes, he has a name. We know his name. We sort of know his name because the pronunciation has faded from memory. Yes, he has a name. I'm not disrespecting the divine name, obviously. But what matters is we obey him. <clears throat> then the surrounding nations will, that survive. So who are these people? Once again, we come back to the topic at hand. They're survivors from the nations, the current nations. Again, uh, England, Australia, my native country, Nicaragua. God has a remnant in every nation of the world. Yes, Israel has a, a exclusive special place. From them are the promises. To them belong the promises, I should say. Uh, to, uh, from them come the Messiah and so on. But there's also a remnant in every nation. God has his people. That's why Jesus in Matthew 24 says he will send out his angels and they will gather the elect, the saints. And there's the words, right? Key words, rebuilt, replanted. I, I talk about often uh, when it comes to this topic about three R's, restoration, uh, regeneration, and renewal. Basically the same thing, right? There's always a repeat of three R's, it seems, in different ways. Here, rebuild, replant, restore, uh, return, all the R's, right? So let me bring up uh, Sir Anthony here, if you have any comments. on. Uh, yeah, I think it's 167 times in the Old Testament. The phrase goes like this, and then in this idyllic time that you're describing from the prophets, and then they will all know that I am Yahweh, I am the Lord God. And you can say to your children, how many persons is I though? If I introduce myself and say, I am Anthony, you don't have to argue about how many persons I am. But unfortunately, such is the tragic confusion in our day that people don't know who God is. Well, he's an I. They will know and understand that I, God, God referring to himself, the God of Abraham, the God of Jesus. I am, as one person, Yahweh, the Lord God. That should be clear. And that should alert you to the fact that we've somehow drifted away from the creed of Jesus. And that's another story how that happened. But a gradual loss of the identity of the one God of Israel. So think of that. I think 167 times God is ultimately going to be known as I. How many persons is I? It's not three. Not three eyes in one eye. Not three persons in one essence, which is a very Greek philosophical idea. Never that. That's a much later development. But I am the Lord. That's what's going to be known worldwide. And nobody's going to argue about that as they currently, unfortunately, do. Okay. Yeah, there's a text, Anthony, uh, in, hmm. uh, if you want to comment on... Uh, Zechariah, which we'll yep. look Good at. Um, what do you make of that verse? Zechariah 14, yes. 9, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. Yes. On that day, there will be how many? One, one Yahweh, one Jehovah. Good. His name alone will yep. be worshipped. Tell me about that. Ed. Well, that's wonderful. Exactly the point. On that future day, this future day is so important that it is encapsulated by the phrase, on that day. In Hebrew, by Yom Hahu, in that very day, that future day that we're all passionately waiting for, there will be one Lord. How many Lords is that? One, not three Lords, not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all equally Lord, but really one being. No, no, that's foreign to the Bible. The whole world will, will acknowledge that God is one. They will know that I am the Lord. And so I will just throw this in as a 
slightly off topic bonus but today i received a letter from somebody saying well anson haven't you read psalm 110 1 where it speaks about the lord saying to my lord don't you know anthony that second lord is adonai well it's not let me let you in very briefly on the greatest mistake in your bibles in terms of capital letters psalm 110 1 very very popular in the new testament yahweh is still one person and he addresses in an oracle there somebody called adoni your children need to learn the difference between adoni which is never deity and Adonai, which is the Lord God. It couldn't be more fundamental to your whole and your children's understanding to know that that psalm speaks not of God speaking to God, but of God speaking to somebody who is not God. That capital L on there is just wrong. You're being deceived. There should be no capital L on Lord there, the second Lord. So um, the second Lord. It should not be capitalized. Yahweh speaks to my Lord. It's Ladoni, and there are translations that happily get that right, but you need to take a red line and take the capital L off that second Lord because you've got two gods there. Then the universe is shaken, and you are shattered, and your brain is confused. There are not two lords, only one Lord God. The second Lord there is, I repeat, not God, not Adonai, but Adoni, which is never a title for deity. So I want to throw this slightly off topic, but I couldn't resist doing that because it's so central. Oh, okay. oh it's uh, central. The Shema, as you know, Anthony, was called the yoke of Absolutely. the kingdom. Yes. The first and greatest commandment is the Shema. <clears throat> if mm -hmm. we don't have that yoke, uh, metaphorical, obviously, That's right. we cannot go to the kingdom. That's the whole point. What did Jesus say to the rabbi, by the way, Anthony? Yeah. Remind us in Mark 12. What was yes. Jesus' response? Exactly. You are closer to what? Yeah. Please tell us about that. Anthony. Yes, well, in Mark 12, 29, we started our service today. A friendly Jew was checking Jesus out. You know, people want to say, well, what do you believe? I want to know if you're sound in your doctrine or not. So a friendly Jew came to Jesus in Mark 12, 29. One of the scribes, that means one of the professional scholars, and they heard Jesus debating, not wrong to debate in a friendly way, noticing how well Jesus had answered them. He was impressed with Jesus. He, the scribe, the professional scholar, asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? And many people, if you ask them, will say, well, just love your neighbor. That's the second one. You missed the first one. Don't miss the first one. The first one, Jesus replied, this is the most important commandment of all. The supposedly great commandment is, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or better translated, the Lord is one Lord. The Lord our God is one Lord, one person. And you're to love that Lord. There's the second commandment. So that makes two very important commandment but the first one you really need to get the conversation going in your local church ask the pastor how many lords are god here because that sounds awfully like what you should say if that is you believe in following jesus and if you think you can follow jesus and snub your nose so to speak at his teachings you're very mistaken you cannot love jesus you cannot follow jesus unless you follow his teachings. That's 1 Timothy 6, 3, 2 John 7 to 9. A fair warning. If somebody comes to you and doesn't bring the teachings, the teachings, the teachings of Jesus, particularly the superlatively important one, then watch out. You're being scammed and we don't want to be scammed. So I'm glad we got, got a chance just to go over that. Thank you, Anthony. Shema. Well, yep. note verse 34. You are mm. not far from the kingdom right. of God. Why did Jesus say that? Because yeah. The, the Hebrews, the Israelites, whatever you yes. want to call them, Jews, they understood that the Shema mm. is the yoke to that kingdom. Absolutely. In other words, if we do not get this one right, right. forget about it. Yep. All right. right. Thank Very you, good. Anthony. I'll bring you back yep. up. Uh, just a slight uh, correction on my part. Uh, I said that there will be a remnant, the survivors from the nations, I, I, I refer to them as a remnant, 
uh, I just want to clear something up. Uh, in church, as I understand it, in, in uh, traditional churches, you hear remnant uh, a lot, and it usually has to do with the church, I believe. And Anthony can correct me later if he... All right, so we hear remnant. But the restoration here, and you see there the heading in the NLT, Restoration for Israel. But really, the headline would be better in my humble estimation if it said something like the restoration of Israel and the nations or something like restoration of Israel and the rest of the nations because I believe this is a view that the scriptures we are reading here of the so-called Israel of the flesh of the nation of Israel being restored yes I guess you can also read into this the church how we will be, you know, in, but I, I believe that this is in, because, why do I say that? Because there are other nations, verse 36, then surrounding nations. So I believe this is the restoration of what Paul calls, not, my, not me, by the way, Paul in Romans calls the Israel of the flesh. So there are two Israels, and I have taught or we have taught about this. You can get on our YouTube or our websites and just search two Israels. But there are two tracks, let's call it. The church, which now Paul calls the Israel of God in Galatians 6.16, I believe. And then you have the nations, which include Israel, I believe. And I think that's what we're looking at here. That's why I say there are also, like, there are two Israels. There are also two uh, uh, definitions of remnant. So it's the remnant church obviously who will be immortalized they will rule and they will rule over you know in a secondary sense the the survivors from the nations that in a sense i i i see that as also a, a type of a remnant so what do you what right. do you say well, to that? that's exactly right the remnant is right in that whole discussion occurred in three long chapters, Romans 9, 10, and 11. And Paul is there saying, now what about my fellow Jews who are not Christians? What about them? And he says there in Romans 9, you should read the whole thing, 9, 10, and 11. He says, I pay them this credit. He said they have a zeal for God. Many of them did. But not according to knowledge. And so then he said, I want to go off and try to save as many of them as I can. And at the end of the day, it's only a few, a remnant, if you like, a small amount who will be saved. But please note that Paul is addressing the issue of then Jewish people, what we roughly call Jewish people, who had a zeal for knowledge, Paul says, but not on the basis of knowledge. So what do they need? Knowledge, 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 understanding. And at the end of the day, they will be a small number of those Jews. Not all of them will respond to the gospel, but some of them will. And they will then form that, that nucleus of a remnant of converted people when the kingdom comes. And you also mentioned rightly that the other nations will likewise, I assume, a remnant of them too. Because it's not everybody, but it's that remnant. You remember the days of Elijah. Elijah was despondent because nobody was listening to what he was saying. They were all going after Baal, a false god. And God comforted him, you know the story very well, by saying there is a remnant of 7,000, I think it was, who have not gone into pagan religion. They're the good ones, a remnant. There's always a straggling few. Jesus himself said, few find the way to life. Jesus said, struggle agonize to go in by the narrow gate because many people will try to go in by that narrow gate to the kingdom and won't manage it. Few people find the way to life. Jesus, I might say, was, I'm using the adjective advisedly, dismal about the future. He said, not many are going to find the way to life. And when I come back, Jesus asked this very dismal question. Will I even find the true faith on the earth when I come back? He seemed to wonder about it. He didn't know, but he was not very optimistic that 
hundreds of millions and millions of people will just all accept him. So you're absolutely right to focus on the remnant, a small, straggling number, either of what we would call Jews today, Israelites, or people of faith from all the nations. You can see a pattern that repeats itself. People are very uh, separationist in their ideas. They tend to say, well, if it's got to be this one, it couldn't be that one. Wait a minute. The Hebrew mind, I learned this at Jerusalem University way back in 1974, can grasp a totality. You don't need to argue whether it's a remnant of Jewish people or the remnant of Gentiles or the other nations. There's going to be a remnant of all those people. You put it all together and you get the great picture about, as you say, the surrounding nations all coming to know that God is one single person. There'll be no triune God around at that time to argue about. It won't be necessary. Thank you, Anthony. So we'll get to more scriptures here. And if you have any questions, by the way, just type them in. I'll try and get them in uh, at the end. So we'll go back to our reader, uh, Barbara. So we will move to Amos 9. So let's start, Barbara, in Amos 9, 11, please, uh, all the way to the end there. Thank you. On that day, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, in order that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this. The time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows shall overtake the one who reaps and the treader of grapes, the one who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the, re the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them upon their land, and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. All right. Goodness, these are powerful passages, folks. Let me just focus quickly here on a couple of key words I see in this other prophet. And can you hear a common theme here? <laughs> the same view the same hope the same image it's amazing these people sometimes are hundreds uh, half half a millennia apart sometimes these prophets hundreds of years or, or something uh look at that uh just focus on verses 11 and 12 raise up i will build again the restoration the palin yenesia the regeneration as uh jesus says to his apostles in Matthew 19, 28, Palin Yenesia, all over again, right? Palin, over again, and Yenesia from the Yenesis word. And verse 12, Israel will possess Edom, restore its former glory. Remember we talked about the umbrella term of restoration. Uh, God will restore, that, that happens a lot so that the rest of humanity, including Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. Now, this is very evocative language, very interesting language as well, because it means that there are so-called Gentiles that God has called by, by his name as well. Remember, he talks in a similar way to Israel, to Jacob. He says, I have called you by my name sometimes. So he's now God, the Father, is now using similar language that he used uniquely sometimes for the Israel, uh, the nation. Now he's, he's sort of changing his tune, let's call it, with Gentiles, non-Jews. And uh, the Lord God, the one doing this, I haven't mentioned this, but God will do this. Have you heard that throughout? I will do this. I will do this. Uh, Anthony brings in very correctly the singular personal pronouns. But what about the fact that he will do it? 
not the United States of America, not England, not Australia, not any other uh, earthly empire from this present evil age. I will do this. Have you heard that? I, I keep hearing it. I said this. I will do it. Uh, no, no one else. Me alone. <laughs> and so on. So, all right. Let's, uh, we'll move ahead uh, here. Barbara, to the next one I had on my list, Isaiah 19, which is uh, my favorite. So let's see. Let's start Isaiah 19. And let me just bring it up here. So if we read Isaiah, same image, same picture here. A message about Egypt, it begins with. So it's addressing Egypt. So then, uh, Barbara, let's go down to verse 16. And if you could uh, start reading there, please. On that day, the Egyptians will be like women and tremble with fear before the hand that the Lord of hosts raises against them. And the land of Judah will become a terror to the Egyptians. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will fear because of the plan that the Lord of hosts is planning against them. On that day, there will be five cities in the land of Egypt that speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord of hosts. One of these will be called the city of the sun. On that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the center of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. When they cry to the Lord because of oppressor, oppressors, he will send them a savior and will defend and deliver them. The Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians and the Egyptians will know the Lord on that day and will worship with sacrifice and burnt offering and they will make vows to the Lord and perform them. The Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing. They will return to the Lord and he will listen to their supplications and heal them. On that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian will come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. On that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be my be Egypt my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel my heritage. Wow. Now, this is a striking prophecy. So it brings in all those elements of the other prophets with a new twist, if you want. Something new. Something beforehand that, as far as I know, maybe Anthony can fill the gap. I haven't heard God say but now something interesting is happening. So, okay, we get the same theme, restoration of the um, non-Israelites, right, of Gentiles, so-called. Uh, so Egypt itself will be restored. There are the key words in the heart of Egypt, in the land of Egypt. Nowhere else, not in Rome, not in Nicaragua. <laughs> this is Middle East stuff, right? Very important. More key words. Make himself known to the Egyptians. will give sacrifice offerings to him. So this is interesting, right? So we talk about the Millennium Temple. So the temple will be, there will be yet another temple. So here are sacrifices. You need a temple for sacrifices and offerings. I think we can all agree on that. And then the interesting phrase in verse 22, that God will heal by striking. That's interesting. So he brings healing through striking, through punishment. and. Egypt, Egypt will turn eventually to the Lord, verse 23. Now he brings in Assyria, the prophet Isaiah. So God speaking through a prophet. Now we're getting a different, uh, more, more here uh, descriptions. And guess what happens with Egypt and Assyria and Israel? They form, that's why I called it, a united kingdom <laughs> nation, a true united kingdom. Uh, sorry, true United Nations, but this one obviously is the United Kingdom Nations, uh, UKN, if you want to start a party. No, just kidding. So look at this, verse 24, in that day, again, code, code word, right? Code language on that day, uh, right? Code language for the Parousia resurrection now. 
So it was the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, Yahweh, that is, becomes the day of Messiah. I think we can uh, understand that. And then in that day, Israel will be the third. Wow. So Israel, the chosen, precious Israel of God in the Old Testament, in the future, will be partake will be part of this united kingdom nations as i call it and then look at the language in verse 25 which the the other prophets were already alluding to vaguely but now here it's brought to in in real focus sharp focus look what god the god of israel says to the former wicked nations here of egypt my people blessed be Assyria. Now, we believe Assyria is, is the territory or the location where the Antichrist himself will come from, folks. This is a very wicked land, but look at here. The land I have made, blessed be Israel, obviously my, my special position. Um, so it's an amazing language here. Again, reversal of fortunes to the ninth degree. <laughs> Uh, to the you know highest degree, so amazing that now they even join the precious Israel uh, of God of the flesh that is to form these uh, what can only be termed a triumvirate, a three nation rulership here. Uh, when it comes to the nations, by the way, the church is above all this, right? We're overseeing this whole situation. We've been immortalized, so let's let's take the church out. Let's take Christians out. This we're looking at are the surviving nations, including Israel. Uh, Anthony, you want to add? Something? Absolutely, and there's one remnant that you haven't mentioned yet, which will give us an even greater extra nations picture, and that would be Amos chapter nine and verse twelve. What does that say? Amos chapter to nine and verse 12 guess who else is going to be there for your widescreen nation idea amos 9 verse 12 speaks about the remnant of who of edom that's a nation on the east side of the jordan isn't it edom they're going to be involved here too a remnant so yes i think there'll be a remnant of all the nations on earth actually but the ones that are mentioned are there's ones particularly in the Middle East, and you rightly say Assyria and Egypt, former bad guys. Edom, the epitome of evil for Jews. Edom was always seen to be anti-Christian, and the remnants of Edom are going to be restored to former glory. All of that, of course, is Acts 3.21. Heaven must retain the Messiah until the time of the restoration of all things, which is the topic of your sermon here, the apocatastasis, putting everything back that has now fallen down. That is hope. Again, I repeat that hope cannot happen without faith and love. <clears throat> but in Colossians 1.4, you cannot have faith and you cannot have love because they are built on, based on hope, H-O-P-E. That's all in Colossians 1.4. So keep that verse in mind. Put it on the refrigerator. And I appreciate Carlos talking about this vision of hope for the future. Thank you, Anthony. Yes, uh, we looked at uh, Amos uh, 9, 12 there, as you can see the highlighted words. Yeah, this is an amazing, amazing view of former wicked, wicked nations. I mean, particularly Assyria. I mean, think about that. This is where the Antichrist <laughs> It will be born. It comes from. We believe he will be a wicked Assyrian king, right? Uh, well, not we. I mean, Daniel, what? Just read Daniel 10, 11. Uh, that'll tell you. So, all right. So, we're wrapping it up here. Any questions? Uh, I, I also had Micah 4 there, but uh, time uh, is upon us. So, I'll just leave you with the Micah 4. And this, reversal of fortunes, the umbrella term for the restoration of Israel, the rest of the nations. The Jeremiah prophecy, we looked at Egypt, Ammon, Elam, Jeremiah 49, Moab. Uh, sorry, we haven't looked at Jeremiah. Uh, you can also put this in your notes, Jeremiah 48. Uh, 
Woe to you, Moab, the people of Chemosh. Destroy your sons are taken into exile, your daughters into captivity. Yet I will restore the fortunes even of Moab in days to come on that day. Code. Remember, folks, code. Not yet. It will come about. Ryrie Study Bible has a good comment on this verse. Moab will be restored to sharing the messianic kingdom. I love it. Goosebump. Goosebump moment. Uh, also, I had uh, something to say about Psalm 48, but I'll leave that for later, another time. All right, the three R's, quickly. Rebuild, replant, restore. I love it. Matthew 19, 28. Say it with me. Palin Yenesia. I love it. Translated here in the Amplified as in the new age. That is the messianic rebirth. Palin, again. Yenesia, Genesis, origin, rebirth of the world. I love it. When the Son of Man shall sit down on the throne of his glory. Is he sitting now in the in the throne of his glory? By the way, where is the, the throne of his glory? Think about that. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with that question uh, for a quiz next, <laughs> next Sunday. You who have followed me, he says to the apostles, will also sit on 12 thrones judge or rule or govern the 12 tribes of Israel. That's the Israel I believe we have been looking at. That 12, the restore, regather 12 tribes. I think that's what we have been reading here in Amos, Micah, Isaiah, and uh, other prophets, Jeremiah. So I hope, folks, um, you, you can study this thing. I mean, these things require a lot of study, uh, a lot of um, prayer. And, and study. Uh, this is a, the grand design. This is the master plan. This is the gospel about the kingdom of God. And uh, it should give you goosebumps. It gives me goosebumps every time I read, especially that incredible Isaiah 19 uh, passage. I think we got one uh, my apologies if I'm not getting to any questions I might miss, but we will get to this one. I'll allow Anthony also a chance to answer this. Let's see. Can you please explain uh, Ezekiel 45, which states that the Messiah will perform sin sacrifice for his own sins? That's a question mark. Because Jesus is sinless as portrayed in the New Testament. Well, let's have a look quickly, and then I'll let Anthony in on this. I believe this is um, the later chapters of uh, Ezekiel have to do, as you know, with this millennium temple. And he talks about the consecrated land there. It starts. And then the prince. Now, who is this prince? Okay. Now, the prince will have the area bordering each side of the uh, area and so forth. So it introduces a prince and princess, says other princes, okay? And my princesses will no longer oppress my people, but will give rest to the land, okay? And then the the question here, as we drop down to verse 22, on the 14th day of the first month, you're to observe Passover, okay? A feast, seven days. So again, I believe this is the millennium, the age to come. So all these things are going to be brought back, okay, on leavened bread. On that day, there's that quote, the prince shall provide a bull as a sin offering for himself and for all the people of the land. <clears throat> okay, there are many princes here in this chapter. These are probably governors, rulers of the people. In, in other words, it's not Jesus. Obviously, Jesus is not offering sin, sacrifice. I mean, he didn't while he was on earth, by the way, because he was sinless. So why would he do that? No, he took sins upon himself. So obviously, I believe, um, I hope um, uh, that's clear. Uh, Nadja, I don't believe that is the Messiah, obviously. That's just one of the princes. 
uh, of the uh, nation there, Restore Nation of Israel. Anthony, if you want to have... Yeah, their leaders. It's absolutely out of the question that it could be Jesus the Messiah. We know from the, Old, from the New Testament that he was sinless. So don't even imagine that. These are governors, leaders, rulers in that restored government system, and they're going to have to be uh, bound by, at least for a time, by the sin offerings in the temple. Now, why God reinstitutes all that, I'll leave him to explain that when it happens. It could be that Israel never did that well enough. They need to learn the discipline. I don't know exactly, but that is not Jesus. That would be a governor, a ruler among many leaders in Israel, certainly. All right. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. And uh, one question for myself. Uh, what does umbrella term mean? Well, you know, it's just a, a way of um, speaking. Uh, how can I describe it? It's, it's just <laughs> an umbrella term is, is, is something that covers many things, right? So you, you can talk about uh, umbrella terms like humanity, I guess, is an umbrella term, covers all kinds of peoples, all types of races. So, yeah, the, the restored the fortunes is an umbrella term that covers uh, a bunch of nations, obviously, a bunch of concepts and themes below it. So it's, ju it's just a metaphor, a way of speaking, uh, an idiom, if you will. So, all right, I think we will leave it there. Sorry, Anthony. You well, gotta... I want to say a summary term. Psalm 110.1 is an umbrella psalm over the whole New Testament. You cannot fail or you should not fail to understand Psalm 101, where Yahweh is speaking to Adoni. Adoni is not God, not God. Take the capital Lord off that one. It's false. There are not two Lord gods. So umbrella is a very good term because it covers the whole subject. It's a summary of the whole system. We all need summaries for our understanding. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, Barbara, did you have a comment before we go? or are we? Uh, well, no. Like you, I, it, Reading this in mass gives gives me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> right. Th thank you, and thank you for for being the reader today. Yep. You did very well. Yep. Uh, so okay, we will leave it there. Thank you, Anthony, Barbara, mm -hmm. and uh, we will uh, wrap it up and be back hopefully next Sunday with um, Isaiah. Uh, what did I say? Forty four. So actually, before I leave, let, let me share some uh, comments from uh, videos we get. Um, a comment on uh, Michelle's Sheep and Good Shepherds video from Sharon, one of our faithful commentators, commenters, is that how you say it? <laughs> Excellent teachings, Michelle. Thanks for bringing this to the table. Amen. Well, thank you, Sharon, for watching out there. On my... Um, video i did a recent uh, interview with a, a person who studied with the jehovah's witnesses uh darren from england uh grant said it was a pleasure listening to darren thanks for setting this up carlos and darren and uh poppy fields thanks darren my family are going on a very similar journey praise god for his truth and grace so I hope you can catch Darren's uh, interesting journey there of faith in the uh, YouTube channel. All right, folks, that's about it. We will close with uh, prayer. Oh, actually, uh, Barbara, since you're still on, would you mind closing with prayer, please? Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for allowing us, our minds, to focus on these past passages and to take them in. Uh, I pray that we will consider them throughout the, the week and return to them um, and to, to uh, study so not only for our own selves, but so that we can pass on this incredible information. We pray for those among us who need healing, and we pray also that we uh, are bold in our witness and that we uh, take our responsibilities to stand for the truth uh, ser seriously, extremely seriously. We thank you for the freedom that we have, and um, we thank you most of all for Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Barbara.
Thanks everyone. Keeps 